today's lecture, we're going to talk about basic transmission genetics. The objectives of lecture, today's lecture excuse me, are going to be to talk about equal segregation, independent assortment, uh, some of Mendel's uh, principles of genetics. Also, we're going to talk about genetic terms, uh, such as the ones listed under that second bullet. Uh, you want to be able to explain those terms, know what they mean. Third objective is we'll explain what a test cross is, uh, how it works. And then finally, we'll talk about how to construct a Punnett square and do a monohybrid cross, a cross that involves one gene. In a separate video later on, we'll talk about basic transmission genetics too. We'll actually talk about more complicated crosses, crosses that involve uh, two genes, or these are called dihybrid crosses. When we talk about genetics, we have to really focus on uh, one individual to start the discussion. And this is a, uh, a uh, early scientist uh, who's also a monk uh, by the name of Gregor Mendel. And he was an Augustinian monk, uh, lived in Europe in the 1800s, had a very strong background in mathematics. And this allowed him to develop a very quantitative approach to studying his model organism, something called the garden pea, something that had not existed before. And this was very important because uh, he, excuse me, he conducted his experiment in the 1860s, uh, but his studies were largely ignored until the 1900s. But really, his experiments involving pea plants showed that genetic, genetics uh, or inheritance based on genetics is not necessarily a blending phenomenon. In other words, if you have a tall parent, a short parent, the offspring don't have to be medium height. In other words, he showed that genetic uh, uh, units are inherited more in terms of uh, discrete units, which is something we'll talk about later on. So it's a very important concept. So Mendel used the garden pea, as I mentioned on the previous slide. This was his model organism. And it was a very, very good model organism, actually. You might say, well, why did he choose this? What was the point of this? Well, a variety of strains were available, very, very easy to cultivate, and it can self-cross or it can self, excuse me, self-fertilize or it can cross-fertilize. In other words, the pea can mate with itself or it can mate with other peas. And so uh, this is very powerful to use uh, in genetic studies. You'll see this as the course goes on. And uh, I think it's also neat to notice that model organisms have their genome sequenced nowadays. So uh, not at the time, obviously, but now we do have that happen. Uh, we know the exact DNA sequence, the exact letters. Uh, they're also very, very inexpensive, and they produce many, many, many offspring. So we can really do uh, very powerful statistics on our analyses. So when Medi Mendel studied these peas, he studied seven different characters. You might say, what is a character? Well, a character is uh, basically what are you studying? What aspect are you looking at in your organism? Uh, for lack of a better word, what thing are you looking at? So here's seven examples of characters that he looked at. One character was seed color. Another word was seed shape, seed coat color, etc. You see seven at the top of the screen here. Each of these seven characters had two traits. Uh, you might say, what is a trait? Well, a trait is saying what version of the character did a particular organism express. So if a character is seed color, let's take the first one in the first column, one trait is that the seed color could be yellow. So yellow is a trait. Another trait is that a seed color could be green. So green is a trait. Uh, other examples are seed shape. A trait could be round or another could be wrinkled. And you see other ones sort of popping up here you know, as, as I go through this slide. Uh, one thing to note is for the seven characters that Mendel studied, one of the traits was dominant to the other trait. And in this case, all the top traits were dominant to all the bottom traits. Uh, in other words, if uh, an organism had two copies of a given gene, one encode, encoded for the dominant trait, one encoded for the recessive trait, uh, the one that encoded for the dominant trait would be the one that is seen in the organism, actually seen. Okay, so Mendel grew these peas for two years to make sure they were pure lines. Pure lines means that they only yield the same type of offspring that they are. So in other words, if you had yellow seeds, it means like all the offspring would have yellow seeds. If you had green seeds, they'd all be green. Uh, pure lines mean they only produce the same type of offspring as themselves. And this is very important to start genetic experiments, as you'll see in a second. So what did Mendel do? He took his P generation. P generation just stands for the parental generation. And he crossed them. So if he had two plants, one with a uh, inflated P pod, almost like it was blown up like a balloon here, and one that was crossed with a constricted pod, where you actually see, uh, looks like a balloon that the air got sucked out of it. And so you see 
uh, you know, sort of these uh, striations where, the, where the, the outer edge of the pod is very tight around the seeds. If you cross these two, what he saw in the F1 generation, F1 stands for filial generation, these are the children, what he saw was all of them had inflated pod shapes. And you might say, okay, well, what's the big deal? Well, there's a huge deal at the time because at the time, if you look at the very bottom right of the slide, most individuals would have predicted that these children would have had pea pods that were sort of constricted, in other words, semi-constricted. In other words, they were a blending or a blend of the two parents. They were intermediates of the two parents because most people at that stage thought genetic inheritance was always a blended phenomenon, which, you know, sort of makes sense. But Mendel found out that was not the case. He did not see these types of um, blended phenomena all the time. So what was going on exactly? Well, Mendel repeated the experiment. He did it with a reciprocal cross, in other words, just switching which um, organism was the female and which was the male. So for the first cross, if the inflated um, pea pods were the males, he would make them the females for the second cross. That's the reciprocal. And he got the same results. So very weird phenomena. So what's going on? Let's look at this more closely. So he did the cross again, uh, continued through the F1, got the same results. Let's say we mate the F1s now, and now we make the grandchildren, or the F2, the filial 2 generation. When we mated those, or when he mated those, what he found was, hey, look, you have some of them where they're inflated pea pods, but look at this. You actually have one that's a constricted pod. Uh, that's very, very odd, because look what happened. You had constricted in the parental generation, no constricted in the F1, but when you bred these two parents, all of a sudden this constricted trait comes out again. Something is there, disappears, and comes back again. Very, very odd. Uh, he did not predict that. And he always, always got this 3 to 1 ratio in his F uh, uh, generation. We look at the phenotypic ratio. Phenotypic means what you're looking at. You know, what does it look like? I to remember phenotypic, I think, phenotypic face. In other words, you're looking at someone's face, you see what they look like. Uh, they don't both start with the letter F, obviously, but uh, they both start with an F sound. So what's going on here? This is very odd to see a trait be there, disappear in the, in the children, and then reappear in the adult generation, a very, very odd phenomenon. What Mendel's ob observations told him were four things. So he honed in on four conclusions here. The first conclusion was that the F1 children looked like the P parents, but they passed something along to the F1, or sorry, the F2 grandchildren, something uh, that you know they themselves did not express. That was very interesting. Another thing he found was that these two alleles separate. One allele goes into one gamete, one goes into another gamete. Uh, we'll talk about this in a second. We haven't really touched upon this yet. Uh, a third conclusion is that one allele is dominant to the other allele. And then the fourth conclusion is that the two alleles separate with equal probabilities. Uh, let's look at these in more depth uh, in, in the next slides. So again, let's look at this example again. Now we're going to put modern nomenclature or modern ways of writing uh, the genotypes. In other words, the genotype is saying, what DNA sequence does the organism have? That's the genotype. And we represent those DNA sequences by letters. Do they have the DNA sequence that gives the dominant trait? If they do, it would be a big I for inflated. Or do they have the genotypic sequence, or in other words, the gene, for the recessive trait, the constricted trait? And if they do, in this case, it's represented by the little i. That's the genotype. Let's put these modern genotypes on and see what Metal discovered. So again, same cross, but we're just adding some uh, nomenclature here. So we have P generation at the top. They mate. Oh, actually, excuse me, they don't mate yet. <laughs> uh, here's the genotypes. So if they're true breeding, we know that this organism here is big I, big I, because it's inflated. Now you might say, well, couldn't it be big I, little I? Because the dominant allele would still dominate the recessive allele, the little I. And if this was big I, little I, which is not, but if it was, you would still see an inflated phenotype. The answer is yes, it could have been that, but it's not, and we know it's not, because these were true breeding plants. So if true breeding, it means they have to be big I, big I. On the other hand, we have a constricted plant. We know it has to be little I, little I. One, because it's true breeding, and also, the only way to get this constricted phenotype is to have little i, little i, where you don't uh, you have any allele to dominate that. So if we cross those two, what happens is the one on the left, the big i, big i, has to donate a sperm, and it only, its only option is to donate a big i. The little i, little i genotype has to donate a little i, egg, and the only option is to donate that type of egg. If we draw a square, unite that sperm, and unite that egg, 
we get the genotype of big eye, little eye. In other words, all the F1 generation had to be big eye, little eye. And if they're big eye, little eye, they all have to be, uh, excuse me, possess inflated seed pods, as you see there. If we cross two of the children, so we're crossing a big eye, little eye with a big eye, little eye, that's what we're crossing, you can see that this would be the Punnett square we'd set up. And when we do this, what we're saying is this individual here is donating these two sperm. This individual here is donating these two eggs. Now, they're not donating these two sperm or these two eggs to each child. Keep that in mind. It's a very important point. They're just saying that these are the possible children they could have if any of these sperm unite with any of these eggs. And to sort of accentuate that point, just to show you, this is something called the principle of segregation. So that left big eye there is that sperm. That little eye is that sperm. So the principle of segregation, what is it? It's saying that one version of the gene has to go to one gamete, in other words, one sperm egg. The other version of the other gene has to go to the other gamete, in other words, the other sperm egg. Uh, you can't have two copies of the same gene going to the same gamete. The same sperm egg cannot happen in genetics. Keep that in mind. If it did, then there's a problem. Uh, but this is the principle of segregation. Let's unite these theoretical sperm and eggs, and these are the offspring that we obtained. You could see here that we have a big eye, big eye, big eye, little eye, big eye, little eye, little eye, little eye. Our genotypic ratio is 1 to 2 to 1, right? Those are the different ratios we have there. Our phenotypic ratio is 1 to 3 children that are going to be uh, have an inflated pod and then one child that's going to have a constricted pod. And you see that with these four offspring here. So these four offspring, these are the F2 children, and we're just writing them again right here so you could see them. So again, that's how Mendel uh, reached his conclusions. And he saw that, hey, uh, each parent's passing along something. He's called a factor. Now we call it an allele, a uh, version of a gene to their offspring. And then these are the phenotypes that we get. There's some terms associated with this, terms I've been using, terms I'm sure you've had in previous, cor previous courses. But I want to make sure that you have them down. So uh, if we say something like homozygous, what we're saying is we have two of the same letter in the genotype. So in other words, an organism is big I, big I, or they're little I, little I. If they're heterozygous, then we're saying they have one big I and one little I in this particular case. Phenotype is just saying what does the organism look like. Genotype is saying what DNA sequences does that organism have for a given gene or both copies of that given gene. Allele is what version of the uh, gene do they possess? Do they possess big I or do they possess little i? The dominant or the recessive copy. Gamete is either a sperm or egg. A zygote is what happens when you unite a sperm and an egg. It's that first cell that is about to become the next generation organism. Monohybrid cross is a cross involving one gene. Dihybrid cross is involving two genes. And there's something we can do called a test cross that I want to talk about now. This is a bit of a side, but something important that we should talk about. Okay, when we talk about a test cross, we're trying to determine the genotype of an individual with a dominant phenotype. So in other words, here's two possible scenarios. We're saying this is one scenario or this is the other scenario. When you do a test cross, what you're saying is you have an organism that has a dominant Phenotypes, in other words, inflated P pod, inflated P pod, but you don't know their genotypes. That's why I have nothing written here. I have nothing written here. If that's the case, how do I figure out their genotypes? That's the point of this problem. How do I figure out their genotype here or here? I do something called a test cross. Here is the test cross. A, a test cross is when you cross this unknown organism with a known homozygous recessive organism. So I'm doing it here, I'm doing it here. You might say, why, un, why a known homozygous recessive organism? If you're doing a known homozygous recessive organism, that organism doesn't matter in a sense. It, it needs to be there to have offspring. It doesn't matter in the sense is, that it's not introducing any genetic diversity. You know that if you see a given little i in any children, it came from that organism. It had to, right? It's all they could offer. So there's two different scenarios we could look at. On the left, if the, the organism could be big i, big i, right, the dominant phenotype, the genotype could be big i, big i, or on the right, it could be big i, little i. So how do we know which it is? Well, if we mate each of these uh, 
organisms in each of these situations. So we do the cross on the left, we do the cross on the right. These are the offspring we would obtain with the cross on the left. Everyone would be big I, little I. In other words, everyone would have a dominant phenotype. Why? Because they can only get a big I from this parent. They can only get a little I from this parent. They have to be big I, little I. Big I is dominant to little I. So all of these would be inflated. And you see that here. If they're all inflated, then you most likely know that the unknown genotype was big I, big I. On the other hand, if you have this cross, you could actually see that here's how the cross would work. Here's the possible sperm, big I or little I. There's some diversity. Again, the other organism can only give a little I. If we do those pun and squares, you could see that actually what we're getting is big I, little I, or little I, little I. So half the organisms will be inflated, but the other half will be constricted. And if that happens, it'll be a situation like this. Uh, realize, it doesn't have to be half and half exactly, right? This is just probability, which we'll touch upon more later. Uh, so it doesn't have to be half and half, but the point is you see both. So if you see inflated and constricted offspring in a test cross, you know that the unknown organism had to be heterozygous. So let's practice a monohybrid cross. Let's practice a cross where we have one gene in the problem. That's how we'll conclude lecture here today. So a little uh, mnemonic I remember to remember how to do this is uh, something called great genetics, please, ooh. Uh, the G in grade stands for the first thing you do is figure out the genotype of the organism or of the parents. The second G in genetics is saying what gametes can that parent produce? What sperm, what eggs? And more specifically, what alleles inside that sperm or egg? The P stands for please, which actually stands for pun and square. Make your pun and square. And the OO is a bit childish when you think about it, but the OO is saying produce the offspring. So if we do that for a given cross, uh, this is how it works. Let's do a very simple example using albinism. Uh, albinism is an autosomal recessive disorder. Uh, a given individual could have one of two alleles, right? And then they have two genes. So they have two shots at having, uh, you know, one of these two alleles. So here what we have is a big A encodes for normal pigmentation, a little a encodes for lack of pigmentation, or in other words, having albinism. But a given person will have, you know, three possible scenarios. Either they'll be big A, big A, and they'll be normal. They'll be big A, little a, they'll still be normal, because the big A is dominant over the little a. Or they'll be little a, little a, in that case they'll show albinism. So those are the different scenarios you could have. When we look at this, we've got to keep in mind that we only care about... Um, the genes that we're working on in a given genetic problem. So in doing a cross, we only care about the genes in that current problem. This is what I mean. Albinism in humans results from abnormalities in a gene on chromosome 11. We have two copies of chromosome 11. We have two copies of each of our 23 chromosomes. So if an individual is little a, little a, as you see on this karyotype, that individual will suffer from albinism. If they're big A, little a, or big A, big A, they will not suffer from albinism. There's other genes in these individuals, obviously. There's thousands of genes, right? There's numerous genes on all of these chromosomes, but my point is we don't write those down unless we care about them in the problem. Otherwise, the problem just gets complicated and involves things that we're not really uh, hoping to focus on. So let's go ahead and do our monohybrid cross. So remember, great genetics, please, ooh. These are the steps. Let's do it. So if we cross an individual or two individuals, right, a male who is heterozygous for this gene, a female who's heterozygous for this gene, this is what the cross would look like. What's the, let's back up a second actually. Great. What's the great? The great stands for figure out the genotypes. Okay. Now I gave them to you in this problem. So if they're given, you don't have to figure them out. But if I just said the word heterozygote for the male and the female, you would have known to write big A, little a for each of those individuals. Second step is figure out the gametes. Now, each of them are going to produce the same gametes, right? The male will produce sperm, the females will produce eggs, but they're going to be the same gametes, right? So the male can produce a sperm with big A, or it can produce a sperm with little a. And in fact, it'll do both, right? The female will produce eggs with big A and eggs with little a. Let's do the P, the pun and square. Let's go ahead and make our pun and square. If we have two types of sperm that are in the problem and two types of eggs, we know that our Punnett square is going to be a two by two matrix and hence have four squares. After we do that, let's just go ahead and mate our offspring. Excuse me, mate our offspring, <laughs> mate our gametes, right, to produce our offspring. 
this is what we get. You could see that when we do this, we have big A, big A, big A, little a, big A, little a, and little a, little a. The genotypic ratio is 1 to 2 to 1. The phenotypic ratio is 3 to 1, 3 normal offspring and 1 albino offspring. Again, these are the odds. It's like rolling the dice in Las Vegas. Excuse me. It does not mean that you have to have three normal children and one albino. It means every time you have a child, there's a 75% chance it's going to have normal pigmentation, 75% or excuse me, 25% chance it's going to have albino pigmentation. Remember, when we say normal, there's no connotation with that in genetics. All it means is the most common situation, right? So it's not uh, derogatory to say that someone is abnormal, right? If we use abnormal, we just say it's not the most common. So you want to keep that in mind, too. There's no social stigma to those words in, in genetics context. Okay, so that's how you do a, a monohybrid cross, and that brings us to the conclusion of our lecture today. Uh, these are the terms that you want to know. You want to be able to distinguish uh, equal segregation. Uh, we did not touch upon independent assortment today, but we'll do it in the next lecture. You also want to be able to know what a test cross is. You want to know these terms and how to do a monohybrid cross all the way through. In basic transmission genetics 2, we'll take it to the next step and we'll actually do a dihybrid cross.